All right, so thank you for coming. Uh, this is uh, the Pragmatic Lessons of Rails and Ruby in the Enterprise. Um, I wanted to start off with mentioning, uh, so I work for Cerner, um, and I doubt anybody in the room that, at least anybody who doesn't work for Cerner knows what that is. Does, is there anybody who knows what Cerner is outside of? Oh, so there's a couple. Uh, so Cerner is a healthcare company. Um, we are, um, kind of our tagline is that we believe healthcare is too important to stay the same. So we are a global um, healthcare company trying to um, facilitate and change the way healthcare is delivered. Um, you know, specifically in the US, that, um, that means quite a few things, but uh, we spend a lot of time uh, working with hospitals, clinical providers, um, um, networks, et cetera, um, providing them te various technologies. Um, most of that you would see with things like electronic medical records and so on, but um, part of what I work on is um, kind of a newer frontier for us, which is population health, and so that is about trying to um, focus on the care of populations as a whole and trying to adjust the way that uh, we approach healthcare, especially in the U.S. where we're trying to change from uh, a healthcare system that's mostly motivated by pay for service, where we want to move that to um, pay for care. Uh, my name is um, Nathan Beyer. Um, my uh, Twitter handle is nbeyer. If you're so inclined, it's not all that interesting, but uh, feel free. Um, I've been with Cerner for over 17 years, so that probably makes me old, I guess. Um, I've been working um, in a variety of technologies over that period of time. Uh, I've been doing open source development for most of that period of time. I had the um, uh, glorious fortune and I guess misfortune of being a, a member of the Apache Harmony project, if anybody knows what that is. Um, it was a brief flame to attempt to create a open source JVM. Um, and the coolest thing that we got to do was be part of Android, and then now we're being thrown out. So um, that, that didn't work out so well. But anyway, so uh, what I'm here to talk about today is kind of how we, we've utilized Rails and Ruby at Cerner. And to, to kind of talk about that, I wanted to kind of give a brief history of what um, web application development at Cerner's looked like. Um, and to start that off with, we kind of have to start off with the beginning, which is around 1999, which also happens to be when I started working at Cerner. Um, I started at Cerner straight out of college. Um, you know, I've got my fancy computer science degree. I know absolutely nothing about software engineering or what it really means to build software. Uh, and at this point, Cerner really isn't doing anything with web development. Um, we were doing a little bit, so they had been experimenting with this um, initial kind of webification of um, PowerChart, which is one of Cerner's um, solutions. They called it, you know, gloriously enough, Web PowerChart. And because all of PowerChart is, most of PowerChart, at least the end user portions of it, are C++ on Windows um, desktops, the natural inclination was, what do we do that works with that? So started building um, C++ DLLs and then throwing them into ASP. And when I say ASP, I don't mean that cool ASP.NET stuff. I mean the pre-ASP.NET world where you did um, just this strange syntax. Um, but we didn't know anything about web development at the time. And um, I don't know that many people did, but Essentially, most of the code looked like this. It was an enormous amount of code written in C++ DLLs, and it was literally writing HTML in C++. The um, amazing brainstorm that I had, which wasn't, I guess, so unique, was that we probably shouldn't put our HTML in the compiled code. We should actually put that in the ASP and separate our concerns. It was an amazing feat. And, um, I started to feel like I was, you know, a key engineer at, at, um, at the corporation. Um, so it turns out like that, that really wasn't a thing and not too many people really wanted that and we didn't really even know what we were, we were doing. Um, and so 
as things evolved years later, we started um, utilizing a lot more Java as everyone kind of does at, at large enterprises. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to Java, at, at that time, Java was still a little, when we started using Java at Cerner, it was still a little bit of a, are you sure you really want to do that? Um, it hadn't quite got to the point where Java was the thing that nobody gets fired for using. Um, and so we'd kind of worked through some of that, but then we'd started doing various amounts of Java development using doing web development. And so we got pretty good at, at doing some of that. We were obviously using struts um, just like everybody else. So this was what you would call Java EE, or back in that day it was Java 2 EE. Um, and at that time, you know, I'd been doing an enormous amount of Java development, so this was fairly familiar. Um, you know, anyone who's ever seen servlets and struts, you know, you know what this looks like. It was just, it was kind of a mess, right? And, and this was the beginning of what, you know, I think our keynote speaker referred to as the XML sit-ups. This was even before then, right? We hadn't quite got to, like, let's configure everything with, you know, XML. As that evolved, um, there started to be some offshoots of things. So around 2009, um, we had uh, some, some teams, specifically this, this group called Cerner Health, that was more focused on consumer kind of oriented stuff. And so they started experimenting with Python and Django. Um, and so in 2009, this was, um, this was a, a completely valid choice. Not that it's not valid today, I guess, but it's just a different situation. Um, and so they started experimenting with Python and Django, and this was a very um, interesting time in that they were kind of a smaller group at, at that moment, and they were kind of you know, off on their own, doing their own thing. There was still lots of Java development happening, lots of you know, struts, and by this time we were talking about struts too and things like that, and all of that pops up. Sort of concurrently, um, I kind of got this weird um, assignment to go build uh, um, a customer-facing um, pseudo e-commerce store. And so this is what we called the Cerner store. Um, and at that time, I, I wasn't completely aware of what was going on with the Python world, and I didn't really, you know, quite understand what these guys were doing, so I didn't, uh, I didn't collaborate too much with them, and, and this was kind of set up as, as somewhat of an experiment, so um, I just spent a moment and said, you know, well, what's the rest of the world doing, and maybe I should try that. Well, one of the things that I noticed the rest of the world was doing was Rails, and it was like, well, let's just give that a try. This is a very isolated piece of um, software. I can kind of go do what, um, whatever I want to go do, and so, at that moment, um, we started using Rails, and it was me, and then I got to hire a couple engineers who were straight out of college, and they had you know, no experience either, and they're like, this seems interesting and cool, so let's try doing that. And so that's kind of where our adventure began, and it, we started doing a fairly standard Rails application. It was simple Rails. We were using um, Ruby Enterprise Edition. We were using Passenger. We were using MySQL as a data store. It was a fairly simple monolithic um, system. And so th that worked fairly well. And, um, but over time, we started to see that like, as our, our needs as a company started changing, we actually needed to do much more um, kind of what I would call cloud-based development, where previous to this, almost everything that we've been doing was um, kind of packaged software. So this is your traditional enterprise delivery of things where you package up all of your software and you give it to your, your client and they get, take it whole or you know, we can go run it for you, but we run it for you in a kind of isolated way. And so as that um, evolution has changed to more of this software as a service, we started needing different, um, different technologies. And this is where then we popped up into we needed to start doing um, mobile development. So in about 2012, we started needing to do mobile development. Well, what we found was that we didn't really understand that you know, with a connected mobile application, you really still need an application on the server side that kind of connects to your application, say, on your iPhone. And so um, I kind of got wrangled in, and I, was, and I, was, I'd, I kind of threw out that we should just start using Rails, because I'd been using this before, and 
I think this would fit in a really nice niche spot here, which is we're going to build some web services to facilitate what our iOS applications need. And so it kind of fit um, a, nice, a nice little realm there in that we could kind of quickly build these applications and it was very productive and easy to use. And so we started building lots of um, basically RESTful services to fulfill our iOS apps. Behind the scenes though, this was a very non-traditional um, kind of system in that there's a lot of, um, the Rails applications themselves didn't connect to databases directly. They interacted through services. Um, and I'm partially to blame for some of this, but for some reason we decided to use Thrift, which if any of you are familiar with this is a binary service protocol and RCP, RPC mechanism. Um, I would not suggest it to anyone. Um, but so we built all these internal services using Thrift and so you had your Rails apps doing that. At the same time, we also started realizing we need to figure out how to do uh, deployment automation much better. And so this is where Chef came in. And one of the big, I think, drivers for Chef was um, it also used Ruby in terms of the way you defined um, recipes and so on and that. So it was actually kind of serendipitous for us to be like, well, we've got all these, these tools, but if we can use some of the same languages, it kind of helps us um, work through things. And then, oh, probably six to nine months later, I got tacked with um, working on the Population Health Initiative, which is what I'm respons partially responsible for now. And we, had, we became responsible for building what we call Healthy Intent. And Healthy Intent is our platform for providing population health services. It's a software as a service um, system. Part of that is delivering web applications and services. And so it was fairly natural at that time to say, let's just start using Rails again. Um, we'll build our web applications using Rails. We'll build our APIs using Rails. Um, behind the scenes, instead of using Thrift, we dropped that. We still needed to use a lot of Java because we build a lot of internal tools using um, Java. And um, unfortunately, or fortunate if this is your kind of thing, we have a lot of big data. Um, and that really means you've got Hadoop, and if you're working with Hadoop, you're really working with Java. I, as much as you want to not work with Java, if you work with Hadoop, you're working with Java. So to build services on top of HBase and those things, we use um, JAX-RS. On top of this, we also defined what we call blue steel. Um, and some of you will get the joke there. but the. Uh, we defined what is essentially a HTML, CSS, and JavaScript uh, framework for building applications quickly. So uh, to some extent, it's a little bit like Bootstrap. Um, it's essentially lots of components that have these, that we can easily pull together and kind of build up an application, and the style just works, the HTML just works, um, and the interaction kind of just works. And it also provides us with consistency. So, that's kind of where we are at today. That's kind of the current state of what we're doing. And so we use Rails um, to do lots of web application development. We use Rails to do lots of public service development. Um, but it's not um, everything that we use. And so I want to kind of point out some of the things that I think are somewhat unique to our environment. And as I've kind of spoken with people, I, don't, I, I say these are seemingly unique because I don't think they are totally unique. I think people just don't talk about them because it's not hip or cool in some, some circles. Um, and so one of the big things is that we really use Rails as just a single tool in our tool belt. It's really, um, it, it's really a component in a very distributed system and so um, this is kind of a very simple generalization of the way that healthy intent would look if you were to think of it from the top down. And so we have lots of Rails instances running that manifest as individual applications. And those, those applications interact with lots of services. And so those services that they interact with will be Java-based services. Some of them we've actually built using Rails because they're sort of a simple um, reference service where it's really just, I want to have some kind of a 
specific domain of modeled, and then I, I need a little database, and then it's a nice little service, and that builds it very simply there. The Java stuff, we've got a lot of um, HBase and Solar, and we use those in, in parallel, so it, I, this diagram doesn't do it justice, but we use, um, if you've ever had to use HBase, it's, it's very interesting for doing you know, key value lookups, but it's really not good at anything else. And almost everything else you need to do is that anything else. Um, so if you need to like search for something, you know, do you find it? You, f you need an index, right? Normally, you know, with, in a SQL kind of world where you use indexes and I do select, you know, where x equals this, you do lots of where statements. You don't get that in HBase. And so we use uh, Solar to kind of help with that. Um, you'd, in, the, in the wild, you would also see a lot of people use Elasticsearch in this kind of fashion. Um, we also do have cases where we use Solar as kind of both. It is the data store and the, the querying mechanism. To, um, it's not super important for the, this kind of context, but obviously underneath that, we've got this huge, massive, big data processing system, and I've simply trivialized it. Um, also because I really don't like big data. I, it's just, it's not fun. So if you can avoid it, I would suggest it. Um, I unfortunately can't. And so to kind of give a little bit of scale in terms of what this really means, what, like at the top there, I've only got little four boxes, but um, within healthy intent, that really represents, I think, something like 15 to 20 um, actual projects. Um, below that, we're probably talking more like 20 to 50 um, projects, and then it kind of blossoms like that. Across Cerner, we, there's probably 50 to 100 Rails projects that are all completely independent, doing all kinds of interesting things. Um, and so um, we've got plenty of usage uh, at scale. So one of the... Um, one kind of unique aspect is how we talk about security, or at least some of the requirements of security. I don't think security is anything unique in terms of Rails development, but we do have um, some specific um, requirements that I, I haven't seen manifest elsewhere. I'm sure they do, we just not talked about. But we have this requirement around user event auditing. And so in a, in a clinical setting, when you have users do, you know, working on um, working on some software and they're taking, they're interacting with a system that has um, healthcare data in it, you, you have to know exactly what they're doing every step of the way. So every step that they do has to be audited and that audit event has to be made available to um, the people running the system. So in this case, it would be like um, hospitals and um, physicians, clinics, et cetera. They have to be able to go back and say, I need to know what this user did, when they did it, what they saw, because um, they could have been doing something wrong. Um, legally, you can get into situations where, um, you know, for malpractice, you have to say, well, can you show me that this person didn't see this chart? I need to go look and do those kind of things. And so we have to actually have a complete system where every single action that a user can take gets logged and audited, and so we store that auditing. And so this is kind of a, um, an interesting security feature where we have to have this whole system where you know, we can spawn off these events and say, oh, this thing happened, this thing happened, this thing happened, and be able to track that. Um, it's not an especially difficult or onerous thing to do, but it does add a lot of complexity to our Rails code in that the application tends to be where you implement the auditing capture because that's where you actually know what the users are doing. At lower levels, it's all system oriented, so you don't know what the, the user's doing. Um, so this adds a lot of interesting complexity in that you've you gotta figure out kind of interesting ways to add DSLs to you know, your controller or model objects such that you could say, well, as a byproduct of this action, submit a view chart audit event for this user and kind of just capture it um, simply. Um, another kind of interesting security feature that we've been kind of experimenting with a lot of in the past few years is really about federated authentication. 
Um, and I think people have seen this before, you, you know, you, when you've got, um, I've got my application and I don't have my own identity. I, I let you log in with Facebook or Google or um, Twitter, et cetera. I kind of federate my identity. Um, in, in our world, federated authentication is, it's the exact same thing, but instead of it being um, Google or Facebook, it is client X has this SAML provider that's built with Active Directory, and they've kind of got this weird system for doing login that doesn't really work, but we do SAML, so it'll all work together. Um, if, if, if you know what SAML is, hopefully you know why I've got a little sarcasm going there, but if you don't know what SAML is, if you ever see it in like an RFI or something where it's like, hey, can you do some SAML, like you just leave. <laughs> don't, don't get involved with it. Um, and so we've had to build um, these, this whole kind of federated session system where we completely separate that from um, our, our applications. And so we kind of have a, a slick separation of concerns now where we have applications that interact with a um, authentication session service. And all we know about is that you have an authenticated session. I don't really care about you know, how your identity was logged in and what you meant with. I just know you're a valid user and I can deal with that. But then this poor session service, they've got to deal with integrating with all of these variety of um, identity providers. And none of them do it the same. It's all a, a terrible, terrible experience. Um, the other, so another piece of security that I don't think is, is completely unique, but it, it is a, a variation on um, what you might, you might generally approach. So when it comes to authorization or access control, um, you'll often hear about the terms maybe like role-based access control where you define, you know, this person is a role, like they're an owner or a publisher or a creator, and you kind of, you have permissions that you do based on that. Um, well, within in the healthcare realm, what we've got is we have a variety of things where it's sort of role, but roles are much more arbitrary than that. Where and so we kind of use what we call group based. You can define groups to be roles, but you can also kind of just define groups to be like I'm in this really cool group, so that means I get to do these really cool things. And so that happens uh, quite a bit. But what makes that much more complicated is that. Um, authorization also has to be based on data in the system. It's not, and this is where the, the more complicated access control is, that it's a user's relationship to data, not a user's role. That tends to be the more complicated and more important security. So a user's relationship to a patient, so say your doctor's relationship to you, right? they get to see your chart because they have a relationship with you, Another doctor doesn't get to just see your chart because they don't have a relationship with you. And so there are hundreds of these kind of database access controls that you have to try to model and you have to try to work through where it creates this fairly complicated situation where you have to have layers and layers of complicated code where it's like, okay, do, are they in this group? Can I let them do this? And then do they have this relationship with the data? Should I allow them to do that? Um, and it's especially complicated because oftentimes that relationship isn't, um, isn't direct, it's indirect. And so it'll be a user's relationship to something like an organization and then that organization's relationship to um, a patient. So I get to see that patient's data because that patient's related to the org and I'm related to the org and so then we both get to do. And this is an extremely kind of painful and complicated thing that Again, this manifests in our Rails applications because that's where we do a lot of our security because that's where the user meets the data. Um, the other, I think, kind of major aspect of things is really what I call development ecosystem. And this is really, um, oftentimes in a smaller environment, it's kind of a byproduct of, of just doing development, but it's something I worry about a lot. It is really how engineers are productive and how they go do their job. What are the tools you have for doing builds? What are the tools you have for 
accessing libraries? What are the tools for documentation for all of the libraries that you're building? How do we make all of that consistent? How do I make sure you're using the right libraries? How do I make sure you're using the right code style? Things like that. Um, one of the things that I think that that pulls in for us is that, so we have an enormous amount of, um, because we have so many projects, Rails projects, that naturally is gonna lead to lots of gems. And so we've got hundreds of internal libraries that we have to manage and maintain. And so obviously we have to have our own gem server. And I don't know if you've ever had to deal with trying to run your own like local or internal gem server, but this is, this is not something that the Ruby community does well. Um, and this is honestly something that I've, I've kind of bristled against for a very long time. Um, so, I mean, I was, for a long time, I was very much a Java developer. Um, and as much as it's, it's kind of gross and things like Maven are kind of gross, um, Maven nailed it in terms of dependency management. They really had, they really work through all of these concepts of I've got to have a repository and I've got to have namespaces and names for artifacts and versions and then I'm going to define dependencies and define all this tree. Um, Ruby Gems did a little bit of that. They've got a, you know, a, an inkling of that. Bundler comes in and tries to do some more of that and Bundler is evolving. Um, but it's still kind of a difficult patchwork of things. Um, and so this is still a very painful piece of like, you know, I can set up my own gem server, but bundler with multiple gem servers is kind of weird, and it'll try to warn you about, eh, you know, oh, there's this name that's the same in these gem servers, but I can't help you fix that. And so it, um, this is kind of a very painful part in that I, I would like to see help in the community in terms of being able to have more of a distributed um, mechanism for dealing with gem management, it's, it's very, very painful. Um, one part of uh, our development ecosystem that's kind of important is, is what I would call builds. And so this kind of encompasses a lot of things, but builds are, are kind of important for us in that, so as a, um, I don't know, I hate, I, again, I use the word enterprise, but as kind of an enterprise, we get tacked on. We've got lots of these regulations and processes. So um, Cerner is an ISO 9001 certified. We have to deal with the FDA. We have to deal with um, HIPAA. We've got ethical obligations as well as our legal obligations. We've got all these things. And so we have lots of processes that are very general and generic that talk about, okay, if, if you're gonna do development, you have to have all of these things that you do in development to prove that you're doing it right, that you're auditing it, that you can recreate it. We have you know, frequent visits from not so friendly people that come in and say like, oh, you're not doing this, you know, this step in your process right. And it's extremely painful in that those people come in and you pay them to come in and tell you you're terrible. Um, I don't, if, for, if you've never dealt with kind of, you know, regulation and process, it's, it can be a difficult thing. And so some of the topics that come up is like, so when we talk about like when you just work with the code, when you're finished, like you can't just say like, I'm finished and then it just works, right? We actually have to go through and say like, we have to make sure it's actually tagged correctly, packaged correctly, we have to make sure it's tested correctly. And you have to prove all of those things. And so it isn't so much that you can just test it and that your unit tests run. You actually have to have the results of those unit tests and you have to be able to prove that you could recreate them and they have to be done and all that thing. Um, and so kind of as a side effect of that, we've created this, this kind of tool we call rollout. And it, it's a little bit like a, a really poor man's maven, but essentially what we've built is um, each project gets a description of the project. We call it the project YAML file. It tells you what the project is, its name, tells you where its source code is, tells you where its JIRA is, tells you all kinds of information. And then we've got a little tool that kind of wraps around things like Bundler and Ruby Gems, as well as um, our doc generation, as well as running our spec and test unit, and then all kinds of other things that we want to pull in. So pulling in, like we want to run Breakman audits, we want to run um, 
a dependency report. So we kind of have to just say, like, here are the real dependencies and do all of these things so that then we can run our builds off of our tags and then archive it. Um, it seems like it's kind of a trivial thing, but it, it can be kind of painful and expensive if you don't just have it and it doesn't just work. Um, and so speaking of dependencies, one of the things that we found is you know, working with, um, with Rails, and I think a lot of people already know this, is that you've, you've got to stay up to date. Um, in, and in, in kind of in our world, that can be interesting in that you know, not everyone is moving very quickly and releasing very quickly. So if we talk about Cerner's kind of um, older software, so software that's been around for 30 plus years, they've got development and release cycles that measure in months and almost a year. And so when you know, a Rails updates come out every few weeks, whether there's patches or fixes or stuff like that, like it's, it's kind of a whole new world. Um, and then if you add in all of the dependencies that you start using, right, all of your dependencies are releasing new code all the time, and then they're also releasing fixes all the time. And if you don't stay up on that new code, it'll break. And so you, you do not want to wait till it's like, oh, they released you know, 2.0. It's like, oh, I just don't have time for that. Like, it, it could be three months later, and they release 3.0, and you're like, oh, I've got some time. I'm going to go do that, that upgrade. It's almost impossible, right? This is like the you know the lightning quick changes that can happen in these environments um, are kind of almost you know difficult. So you've got to stay up to date. So fortunately, we've gotten pretty good at this. Almost all of our um, Rails applications in the healthy intent environment I was talking about are all running four two five or six. I, I think it's four two five. I don't know. But we've we've kept them up to date very quickly. We move as fast as we can. Um, and also at the same time, I would say we like to trim them as fast as we can. Um, you've got to keep a handle on the dependencies. You cannot just say, let everyone decide to be like, oh, I think this is a cool one. I'm going to go do this and pick up that. Um, both from a practical and pragmatic standpoint, as well as a development control standpoint, you've got to vet your dependencies. So. We don't just go pick whatever we want. You can't just go out and say, like, oh, I'm going to start pulling this down because it's the latest, coolest thing, right? Um, yeah, like in JavaScript land, like that's even worse. I don't know. Like, I, 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 don't, I don't get involved too much in that world, fortunately, but I can't imagine dealing with that. Um, but you've got to vet your dependencies. So we spend a lot of time actually trying to understand um, you know, you know, most of it is open source dependency. So you have to go look at that dependency as like, is, if it's a community, is the community you know, actively maintaining it? Are they still developing it, right? You can't just, if it's one dude, that's, that's a risk. I can't take a risk on a dependency just because it's super cool, right? It actually has to be valid. Right? If it's one guy, there's a risk that guy's gonna fall off the earth, right? Or he's just gonna get bored, right? And, the mitigation for that, for us, is if that guy falls off the earth, we own his code, right? So that's a, a, you know, a challenge that you think of, because like, you won't necessarily be able to remove it instantly. So the moment that becomes you know, lost, you own it, you know, it's yours to deal with. So this is something that we spend a lot of time with kind of talking about. Uh, so try to do this quickly. Some of the lessons. Um, you have to be aware of culture shock. So as cool as Rails and Ruby are, people will hate it just because it's different. Um, and so if you got Java developers, you'll see things like this a lot, where like, I didn't even know you could do this, where like, you could do private and then public again. Um, this, was like, this was really cool. I thought that was awesome. Um, but then just things like, why do you need a factory? Right, like, and the best part was like, this was a service factory. It wasn't in a library. It was in a Rails app. So it was like creating an abstraction that just you didn't need the abstraction. Like everywhere you needed to do, you could have just done new for the service, and it would have been fine. Um, and then hidden in here too is this interesting. You see this dot absent. Like they actually built an extension to like string and nil and like all objects to add the absent, which is really just the nil question mark um, 
feature, you know, function that's already built into Ruby. I was like, no, I just don't trust it. I'm going to build it all myself. I, like, this happens. I, I don't know how many times we've seen this. Um, the other one is um, if you run into, you run into this world where, like, if it's all static types, right, people just are afraid of dynamic typing. Right? I, don't know, I don't know why. Um, you know, I've never kind of understood this. It's just like, if I'm in Ruby, it's just the way it is. If I'm in JavaScript, it's, it, it's its own thing, right? These are all their own thing. But people will spend a lot of time and energy writing hundreds of lines of code on, like, is this type string? If Is this type hash? Is this type? Like, to go through all of this stuff is like, so you have to kind of be prepared to teach them that duck typing is OK, and that loose typing is OK, and that, like, it might just be nil. It's OK. Um, all right, those, it, there is serious fear about this. Um, and as an aside, I, I've, I've tried to, there also seems to be a weird fear of this in the big data world, too, is that um, there, there's this fear of, like, text, where it's like CSVs and JSON are just plain text versus I've got to have protobufs or Avro and blah, blah, blah. Like, and I, I'm not, I, I haven't completely decided this, but I think that it's pretty much the same thing as static typing and dynamic typing, right? Everyone who's like, I've got to have these protobufs and Avros is like, these are all static typing people, right? It was like, if you can just deal with JSON and CSVs, you know, you're probably just a dynamic type of people. And I think you'll, you'd see that too if you go dig into these, any of these big data conferences or technologies. People are using Python, right? All they use is CSVs and JSON, right? People that are using Scala, right? It's Avros and, and Protobufs. It's, it's a very interesting dynamic. And it's like, you've got to have your types, and I've got to have my data types, and it's, I don't know. Um, one of the other pieces that, I don't, and this isn't just a, a Rails thing, but I've seen it pop up more in Rails because of the way that when you work on a Rails project, it kind of encapsulates things, is that there's a lot of misconceptions around reuse. And so I see three things that um, I often bristle against. And so one of them is what I call micro frameworks. And this is like where it's, it's related to everyone wants to write infrastructure. I guess, I don't know, and maybe this might be just me talking about a Cerner culture thing, but like, like you are a cool guy if you're writing the, um, the architecture and the infrastructure, right? Like, like, you're not so cool if you're writing, you know, features and functionality. So you tend to see this, like, I'm going to create some frameworks within my Rails app that are going to make developing this Rails app be super awesome, right? And sometimes this is creating abstractions over the existing abstractions and kind of doing... Um, things. Um, the other piece is like it's lots of do not repeat yourself when it's really not repeating yourself all that much. Um, I, I think reuse can be tortured and overused, um, and it, it really doesn't work at scale. And what I mean by scale is when I talk about healthy intent, which is the organization I work in. So, and I'm responsible as the principal architect for like the direction of about 300 or so engineers and architects. When you're dealing with 300 engineers and architects, reuse is a little overrated, right? Because each individual person thinks they are dealing with reuse and that they are creating the best thing. But what happens is you get 300 snowflakes, and they're all special, and they all want their own frameworks, and they all want to be like, no. I'm going to do it this way because it's super cool to do it this way, and I'm going to make sure this Rails project does it this way. And then what I end up seeing and dealing with is that I've got this Rails project that's a snowflake and this Rails project that's a snowflake. And the only difference between them is that one of them has domain model X and one of them is domain model Y. But all of their code is completely different. So I can't move people around and be like, hey, hey, can you help me build this feature over here? They're like, no, like, that thing's crazy looking. I can't believe they went and did that. Like, it's like, but if they were to just been doing it my way, it'd be totally perfect. I was like, well, like that person over there is saying the same thing about you. And I was like, and so this is something that happens, and, and I don't know that it's necessarily enterprise problem, but at scale, it happens a lot. All right, so I don't know if I've got any time, but if there's questions, I um, will come answer your questions. You can come up, we can chit chat. 
Um, I have three little reservations for the Cerner party at, that you can get into if anyone really wants to get in. I can give you one if you um, ask me an interesting question. Tomorrow, at, as when the booths open up in the exhibit hall, um, tomorrow they're giving away a raffle for a Jackstack gift card, which if you're in Kansas City, you can go to Jackstack and get your barbecue fix. I believe it's like $100, so it's like more ribs than you could, you could deal with. Um, and then I believe it's the Friday, we're giving away a Phantom drone, which is like a $1,000 drone, and it's super awesome. I, I, um, so I would suggest you go to the booth and get that. Um, there's also people walking around that have the Cerner Engineering um, uh, hoodies, because no one else is wearing hoodies. Um, you can go chat with those people about Cerner stuff. Uh, again, you can come up and talk to me. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time. Thank you.